So yeah, let me go ahead and get kicked off with our presentation uh, from the Smart Contract Research Forum. Uh, again, I'm Eugene. I'm the head of operations at SCURF. Uh, and today, I'm going to be chatting with you all about research impact networks. So in general, and if you want to grab the, the SCURF PO app, which we did across a few of our events that are taking place this week, please feel free to grab that while I run through the agenda. Uh, in short, I'm going to talk about impact networks for a little bit and just what they are and how I see them relating to research and to systematically changing knowledge environments. Uh, and then talking about what I'm kind of defining as knowledge ecosystems, talk about what we see that looking like in Web3 specifically, and about the SCURF roadmap in the context of that. So to start talking about research impact networks, I figure a good place to actually kick things off is with the question of what is a network? Uh, you know, let's start with defining our terms. Uh, and so, you know, the whole idea of an interconnected group, uh, you know, here it says of people specifically, but it could be of a, you know, of a variety of biological systems uh, or some extended group of individuals with similar interests or concerns. And so, you know, networks can be seen in more of the pure biological systems uh, as well as in uh, social networks, something that we're all, I'm sure, uh, very well aware of, <laughs> probably even more so than we'd like to be. Uh, and then, you know, humans have also built a variety of technical uh, networks as well. And so in the context of impact networks, and I don't know how many folks have actually specifically heard of impact networks before, but I really like this core concept of impact networks being a mix of vibrant communities and healthy organizations. And so as a result, they can be relational while being structured. They can be creative while being strategic. It's being able to manage and have some both the benefits of just healthy, vibrant communities as well as well-functioning organizations. Uh, and I think this idea of some of the shared principles around, you know, the community principles of sh uh, shared principles, excuse me, of resilience, of self-organization, some of the elements of healthy organizations in terms of uh, actually having an operational backbone uh, and having a bias towards action is one that personally very much resonated for me. And the whole idea of sort of trying to increase the flow of information, decrease time wasted, energy wasted, uh, encourage as much strategy alignment as it makes sense for the various network components and players, uh, and trying to think through different players at different scales and how do all these groups work together. Uh, and this is all quoting from David Ehrlichman's book, uh, Impact Networks, which is a, a great one if you're generally interested in the topic. So as I'm going through the remainder of the presentation, please just keep in mind this idea of impact networks, uh, the fact that different networks will actually be most impactful and be most effective at different scales, depending on what they are trying to accomplish, and recognizing that fact that any kind of future system of change will most likely actually be composed of a network of networks. It's not just going to be a single network or a few, but networks will be built around concrete missions and focus areas, and a collection of those kind of coordinated impact networks could actually lead to a much more focused systematic change. So when we think about knowledge networks, or as I'm going to bucket these as intellectual networks, which I don't like that term, but I, there's just too many similar terms being thrown around, so I need some disambiguation. So for any networks that are actually focused on adding to the overall base of knowledge, uh, at least in the scientific sense and especially academic sense, you know, there's the actual research component. Uh, so I guess presumably in this, right, you're starting with an existing base of knowledge, then there's a network of individuals that want to run experiments or tests uh, have hypotheses they put together to propose new knowledge to get added. That knowledge then gets reviewed and published and put out somewhere. Uh, and as a result, we can now kind of amend our general uh, shared knowledge database uh, with this new information. And so on the research network side, because it is easy to just broadly say research as if that's one cohesive thing globally, uh, forgetting of all the actual constituent networks that uh, play into the overall kind of research network landscape. Because there are a variety of academic institutions, there's a variety of private institutions and in industry, uh, there's more independent research groups as well as citizen science groups, uh, and then there's groups that are trying to build across those. For anyone who spent time in academia, you know, the whole idea of the mission of we're connecting industry and academia, it's, you know, it's super trite because of how, many, how often you hear that with no real actual uh, meaningful change on the back of that. It's just sort of realistically a company saying of like, hey, we just want to get connected to both of these areas. 
Right now, I'm kind of bucketing review and publication networks together because I'm actually unaware of many that disambiguate the two and that separate out where review happens uh, that is not directly tied to conference publication or to a journal publication specifically. So I see these two networks as, as, of, as of now really having high overlap. And as I briefly alluded to, these three networks of research review and publication for me kind of constitute uh, what I'm dubbing intellectual networks here, but they're only one aspect of a larger uh, ecosystem. And so for me, this is what I'm thinking of as sort of the knowledge network stack, so to say, where you need a set of intellectual networks, right? You need the people doing research, doing review and publication, but then you need the actual social network layer and how are we actually connecting and building community across those? How are we performing communications in terms of both media and advocacy? How are we letting the world know about the research that's coming out? How are we trying to actually affect change and make sure that people adopt some of this knowledge and it doesn't just live on, you know, as we heard uh, predominantly on PDF somewhere in someone's uh, virtual filing cabinet. And then at the end of the day, all of this work actually needs to be financed and operationalized. And I'll go through in a little more detail right now with some of these uh, the actual components of the networks within them. I already spoke about this one, so I just want to add that I added a researcher training component. So for me, in my mind, this is kind of taking PhD level folks and getting them dedicated to a lab, right? So it's someone who's already put in a lot of very focused time and attention, and it's giving them that final kind of nudge of training or the opportunity to actually do the work uh, to be an actual researcher and then you know, perform review, publication, et cetera. On the social side, this is where I see a much wider sort of learning pathway into it. So anywhere ranging from people who are aspiring researchers themselves, all the way through budding researchers of say, you know, equivalency of being a master student and you're really, you're almost there and ready to be at that kind of depth of research level and you just might not have had the opportunity yet or, the, uh, or some concrete fo focused learning opportunities. And combining that kind of layer alongside media and advocacy and alongside actual community building can really create strong culture binding activities across all of these different networks. Right, because I think one of the important aspects of thinking about this through the prism of networks is recognizing that each network has its own people constituting it, which means they have their own culture. And if you think of these larger ecosystems as being systems of many, many networks coming together, there's a lot of room for cultural misalignment. And you know, that's even before we get to where's the money coming from and who's doing the work, right? Just people coming together, we do need some kind of culture of acceptance of differences. Because, and that can itself can take many different forms. And so I think that this social layer is actually tremendously important to focus on to think of how can we create enough overlap on cultures to make sure that all these various networks, bless you, can actually work together in unison. You know, I think on the financial side, it's probably a little more straightforward. Uh, I have a feeling everyone here has dealt with funding in some kind of way or other, and uh, the joys of finding the groups and pockets of areas uh, where there are actual funds to give out to research. I think the operational one is one that I, I want to click in on for a moment because ops, in my opinion, is one that it's usually a function that is very not glamorous, it's not sexy, no one's like, yay, I want to be an ops person when I would grow up, right? It's, it's not one of these things that attracts as much attention, and yet, you know, talk to any DAO these days or anyone building a project or a community, it's usually one of those des most desperate needs of, hey, I just need people who can really get stuff done, and when they tell me they're going to do a thing, it actually happens. And that really exists within organizations, and that's already challenging enough. So what does operations as a public good look like? What is actually providing, in the context of research, training people up to be quality research project managers, and then giving those resources away to other ecosystems? So how do you genuinely support intra-organizational collaboration by injecting some of those operational needs? And as mentioned on the culture side, right, this is not a network itself. I don't think it's fair to categorize culture in any kind of network base, besides the fact that I don't see any kind of network with humans that cannot have culture. Like humans inherently bring culture to the table, whether or not, I don't know whether, I don't see why we wouldn't like it, but just like there's no way around it, right? When humans get together, inevitable cultures form. Uh, and so I think it's very important to think of, again, where is there room for that potential misalignment? And so this is just an overview of kind of, you know, the stack side here with the intellectual, social, financial, and operational, and some of the uh, appropriate network layers under each one of those. And so this is what I'm kind of uh, dubbing as a knowledge network overall, uh, this combination of all of these different networks coming together in a focused topic area. 
And so what does it mean to actually operationalize something? Because I'm sure it sounds like I'm hanging out up in the clouds, and I want to really bring it back down to reality and thinking about how do you put something like this into the world. And so that's where uh, I'm really interested in, and we're excited at SCURF, and I'll tell you about the specific project in a moment, but we're really excited to, to kick off an effort of trying to create a variety of decentralized research centers that will effectively create all of the component networks, and realistically, we don't want to create it from scratch. It's about finding all the existing groups that are doing the relevant work and bringing them together and building that ops and financial layer around them to make sure there's more incentives for groups to want to play well together. And doing that in a focused topic area with a focused scale and really clearly defining, especially to kick off, of who is doing the heavy lifting and where is the money coming from, ideally with as, as few strings attached as possible to truly focus on the end outcome and not on just helping a single organization who's in the position of uh, you know, influencing funding more so. And so I just want to briefly mention on the architecture side as well, because I was just mentioning you know, here on, on the left side of all the different knowledge networks, but you know, networks are one component of it. All networks, especially if they involve information, if they involve communication, if they involve decisions being made, we are using some tools. There is architecture in place. And each one of those networks can have different tooling across all of these areas. And so how do you actually create technical alignment for people to just be able to share their information and have the infrastructure uh, and the tech stack so that people can actually facilitate more collaboration? Because uh, when these things are disjointed and non-coordinated, that again just increases the fact that there's 12 people doing the exact same thing and never really realized that just because they didn't have the right channels of communicating and sharing with each other. And obviously, culture and the convenience of use of some of these tools, as a few projects have mentioned, are also highly important, because we can create the ideologically perfect thing in the, in the history of all things, but if it's not actually convenient for people to use, you know, it's only going to be in small enthusiast communities. So for me, this is all leading up to uh, what we at SCURF are really excited to try to support creating uh, around Web3 research specifically. So we see this landscape up here of a variety of different decentralized research centers. And each one of them will have their own uh, focus in terms of topic area. So the first one, uh, to give a punchline from a few slides from now, the first one that we're actually going to be supporting is creating a DAO research hub in coordination with MetaGov and with the DAO Research Collective. And we are going to be working together on building a wider network that brings together academics, that brings together all of the relevant industry players doing research, and that injects more funding, creates actual pathways for uh, new structured research opportunities or for those coming out of academia for gift-based funding opportunities, for sponsored research-based funding opportunities, as well as uh, at least providing opportunities of potential consulting work as well. And if we have this kind of landscape where there's these variety of decentralized research centers that each go super deep into their, requisite, into their focus areas, so say, from our perspective, we want to see governance, and then security, and then cryptography, and then privacy, and you know, all of these research building blocks in the Web3 space, there do need to be some meta layers to be able to support the overall activity. And we see at least right, things like review and publication. Technically, they can live within each one of these centers on their own. Right? Governance can have its own journal, and so could security, and so could every other kind of research subcategory. But is that actually what's best for the space? And we don't know the answer to some of the questions that I'll be posing, but we're excited to see this landscape of experimentation and to work with all the other groups doing interesting work in this space to just see how can we all support each other so that within a few years and as soon as possible, we can actually confidently answer some of these questions empirically and not just purely theoretically or gut feeling based. And at SCURF specifically, we've been working very hard to create this meta-level knowledge network layer where um, I will show uh, in, in a moment what that kind of looks like for us and where we've been adding that activity. But again, I was just mentioning this DAO research hub. And if any, this is a QR code to the Telegram that we created, because yay crypto, more Telegrams. Um, but you know, we created a Telegram group to actually focus an uh, area for at least folks who are very interested in this. And at Global Governance Gathering over the last two days, we actually had a, a six hour breakout on Monday on DAO science. And then yesterday, we got to do another panel on it. And we're excited to see some of the community coming together around that 
and we are actually starting going out for funding on this. Uh, and all of the funding will go towards uh, embedding postdocs and academic fellows across some of these networks and to build those bridges, uh, as well as to build that operational layer uh, and to introduce what we see as a new role type in the Web3 ecosystem, which haven't thought of a better name yet, but for now I'm calling them community cross-pollinators. So can you hire community managers, but their role is, hey, you as a community manager, go hang out in those four communities and tell each one in their community calls, what you're seeing in the other communities, and then write about all of that on the SCURF forum. And that way, there's this area where we can bring back some of the knowledge of what's happening around governance in a few governance communities in a single repo where we're not actually trying to own anything. We're only pointing back to whatever all the original information is, but there does need to be some intellectual facilitation layer so that people can at least be aware of it. And so the work that we've been doing at SCURF, you know, on the architecture side, we've been building our forum and our GitHub to have this publicly available repo. Everything we do is free and publicly available. We don't charge anyone for any, any of our activities. We've been actively building a community, uh, both in terms of Discord, uh, Discord and the forum, starting to be more at events uh, such as these at ETH Denver, where we also got connected with a bunch of DSI projects initially. Uh, and really thinking about what does providing that operational layer look like. And so we're very interested in hiring a bunch of project managers to figure out how can they best actually be supportive for a variety of these research communities. Uh, and we've also had a variety of uh, funding opportunities that we provide for researchers in the Web3 space as well. And so to date, SCURF has very much been focused across Web3, and now we kind of want to split that focus into the meta layer as well as starting to dive deep into each topic layer. Uh, and in a world where we had more time, I'd tell you a little more detail about this. Happy to chat about any specifics on SCURF stuff later, but uh, it's really getting to the point of we are starting with the DAO Research Hub, and we are very excited to then start working with other relevant communities later this year into next year to start building additional hubs. And security is going to be the next one that we're most excited about uh, around smart contract audit security and security in the space overall. And we recognize that there are a tremendous amount of open questions around how to do science better, how to do Web3 research better, how to do governance better, you know, pick any layer of information we're talking about. There's a ton of open questions. And we are not pretending to have the answers. Uh, what we are trying to do is create this active experimentation landscape and to build bridges and communities as much as we can, again, so we can collectively work towards answering some of these questions together. And so if anyone here is actually interested in getting involved and wants to work and collaborate on Web3 research projects, we're definitely hiring for a bunch of roles. Please come find me later. Uh, I'll have my social stuff up later so you could uh, ping me there. And in my final remaining time, I also want to mention that part of this experimentation landscape for us right now is actually starting a series of open peer review experiments where we are creating a minimum viable peer review process. And if you want to learn more about this, we're actually having a community call at 12 p.m. Eastern next Thursday uh, on the 28th, I believe that is. Uh, and Umar, who's one of the folks uh, who's been awesome in helping out with all the event planning here, him and another contributor, uh, Nick Link, uh, will both be running the, uh, the community through our current process. But short story is we're focusing what peer review could look like for independent researchers, for folks who are not pushing towards a publication venue uh, or towards a conference. And so we're definitely going to be presenting more on this soon. We're going to be running our first experiment starting May-June timeline. And this is sort of you know just updating with some specifics of the first of the decentralized research centers is this re DAO research hub that we're building. We're starting to experiment on open peer review. And that bottom layer is what SCURF is overall really focused on. So thank you all for uh, spending some time, both for the presentation just now and also for, again, for just joining overall. Uh, there's my socials info as well as our forum info. Uh, this QR code goes to our Discord in case anyone uh, thought that was fun enough that you actually want to be part of some Web3 research community and you want to get right involved. Uh, and yeah, yay over notification. I see people are joining, lovely. Um, so yeah, thank you all. And with that, uh, I will invite up Patrick, who is going to be the moderator of the next session, uh, as well as Thomas, Cena, and Nicholas. So, uh, round of applause for the transition in the next panel. <laughs>